book of Ruth, chapter 2, and beginning from the first verse to twelfth verse, I'm going to start reading from the chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, and greeted the harvesters, The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. But Boya said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law. Since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. End of this chapter. Uh, father God, we do thank you uh, that you're a kind and generous and good God. Uh, and that you speak to us really clearly through your word. And Lord, this part of it we're really thankful for. This is a, a lovely, a beautiful story. Uh, please help us to see uh, what you're doing in this story and what you would have us do as a result of it. And we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Uh, now, there are lots of uh, great love stories in our culture. Uh, I've got a few here. So here's the notebook. Amazing love story, so I'm told. Uh, uh, <laughs> then all the movies with um, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, you know, we've all seen these, right? So you've got, uh, what's in the middle there? You've got male, Joe versus the volcano, sleepless in Seattle. So the night that um, Nana and I got engaged, we went out to dinner somewhere and then we went home and watched sleepless in Seattle and then I proposed to her and she said yes, right? So there's a tip for you. Uh, if you're looking to do that sometime in the future, sleepless in Seattle gets the job done, right? Um, then you've got Shrek. That's a pretty good love story, I reckon. Uh, this one, Crazy Stupid Love. Who's seen this? This is hilarious. If you haven't seen this, get it out. It's really, really funny, right? Get it out. As if there's like a video store still. And like those things exist. Um, uh, then there's this one, Terminator 2. That's a really good love story, uh, I think. If you don't believe me, uh, it's true, right? It's a true story. Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, is a Terminator T800 Model 101, to be precise. Uh, and if you think a machine can't love, think again. As the movie rolls on, we're not going to watch it now, as much as that would be good fun. Uh, but Arnie, you'll know the story, Arnie grows to love John Connor and his mum, Sarah, so much so that he spends the whole movie saving their lives. He gets shot like a thousand times in the movie. Uh, and then at the end, he gives his life to save humanity. Heard that story before? Hmm, right? Most stories in Hollywood kind of have gospel overtones, weirdly, anyway. Um, but Terminator 2 is a great love story, just has lots of guns and explosions and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's a perfect date night movie because it keeps both husband and wife happy, right? Um, anyway, as good as those stories are, 
They're not a patch on the Bible, right? The whole Bible is a, a gigantic love story uh, that kind of goes like this. God made us and loves us so much uh, that despite the fact that all humanity uh, have turned their backs on God and to varying degrees done exactly the opposite of what God tells us to do, uh, God's love for us remains to the extent that he becomes the man, Jesus, who then shows us exactly how much God loves us uh, by giving his life for ours. He takes our sin on himself and he gives us his righteousness so that we can be reunited with God and enjoy him forever, right? That's the sweep of the Bible. That's the story of the Bible, if you like. Right? It's a gigantic love story. Ruth is a little book in the Old Testament. It's only four chapters and it's like a mini version of that giant love story and I reckon it's one of the most beautiful things in the Bible. I love this. Uh, and in case you missed last week, we'll just have a quick recap so you can get caught up to speed. Like any love story, you've got to meet the characters. So we meet Naomi's family. Naomi's the wife. Her name uh, means pleasant. You might remember that from last week, uh, which is a lovely name, Naomi. Pleasant. Nice, right? Elimelech is the husband. His name means my God is king. That's another cool name. Not quite sure what happened when they named their kids Marlon and Kilion. <laughs> Because uh, Marlon's name means sick and the other bloke's name means destruction. Um, probably not the best names to give your kids, just as a tip. Like if you're going to have kids soon, maybe not Marlon or Killian, right? Something else. Uh, anyway, there's a famine in Israel and Elimelech decides to move his family to Moab. And in case you're wondering, that's a very bad decision, right? That was not a good thing to do. He should have stayed in Israel and trusted that God would provide for his family. Uh, anyway, they move, they stay in Moab for 10 years. The boys grow up, it gets time to get married uh, and they get married. Only there's no Hebrew women in Moab uh, who love the God of Israel to marry. So they marry Moabite women who worship a false God called Chemosh. Uh, so things are going from bad to worse. This is not looking good. But then Elimelech and both the boys, Marlon and Kilion, get sick and die, uh, which is, again, not really a surprise. If you name your kid sick and destruction, they're probably not going to live long, right? So there you go. Now... That leaves Naomi a widow with two daughters-in-law who are now also widows, uh, Orpah and Ruth. Naomi decides to go back to Israel. First good decision in the story. Orpah decides to stay in Moab, but Ruth, Ruth's different. Uh, her name means companion or friend or vision of beauty. It's a good name, isn't it? Right? Uh, and she's had a conversion experience. Somehow in this mess, she's had a conversion experience and she has come to trust the God of Israel pretty much completely. And although Naomi urges Ruth to stay in Moab with her own people and whatnot, uh, Ruth's having none of it. And she gets to say this, which I reckon is one of the most beautiful things in the Bible. She says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now, you can only say something like that if, you've, if you really have come to completely trust the God of Israel. Because she's giving her whole kind of life. She's putting all her eggs in this one basket. It's amazing. So off they head, 75 Ks. Uh, back to Israel, which is roughly like us uh, walking to a bit past Katoomba in the Blue Mountains. Only there's no roads and it's quite dangerous. Um, and while they're on the way back, uh, Naomi decides that she's going to change her name from Pleasant to Bitter. Right? So she calls herself Mara. Uh, she's a widow, her daughter-in-law's a widow. Uh, she's lost her husband, both her sons are dead. And you kind of think, you know what, bitterness is probably reasonable. I think, I think sometimes we, we look at things like this in the Bible and we, we, we get a bit judgmental. You know how sometimes Christians can be judgmental? I wonder if you've come across that. <laughs> but sometimes we can look at that sort of stuff and go, oh, gee, that's really poor, isn't it? Well, if you think of what her life's looked like in the last little while, you kind of go, well, bitterness is kind of understandable. Uh, that brings us to chapter two, where we meet Boaz. Uh, and Boaz is the dude of dudes. Now, his name means strong man okay so when Solomon built the temple you know in Jerusalem uh, it had these two massive bronze pillars that held the thing up and he called one of them Boaz 
I don't know what they called the other one, Frank or something, but the other one, well, one was called Boaz. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's after this guy who we meet in Ruth, it means strong man, right? So you call your kid Boaz, kind of a weird name, but it's a good name, right? Now what we see in Ruth chapter 2 is godly people behaving in a godly way toward each other and honouring God in the process, right? Uh, Boaz and Ruth are faithful people. They love God and they love his people. And we get to see that faithfulness lived out here, right? So gentlemen, uh, we look at the way Boaz treats Ruth and we get to see how God expects uh, believing men to treat women, all women, and no surprise, it's the, it's the polar opposite of what our culture tells us, uh, how, how our culture tells us to treat women. But when you get through this, you think to yourself, gee, if only more men were like Boaz, all the women that we know would be so much safer than they are currently in our world. And ladies, you get uh, to see a demonstration of the way you should rightly expect to be treated by Christian men, which then tells you that if you're not being treated like this, put your hand up and ask one of the other Christian men around the place for some help. Now, this is very instructive, Ruth chapter 2, I reckon. So we already know from Ruth chapter 1 uh, that Ruth loves God and trusts him, and in chapter 2 we get to see what that faith looks like, right? So she trusts that God will provide because she knows God's character, and she puts that trust into action. It's harvest time in Israel. And the Old Testament had this provision for poor people that the harvesters would not collect the grain right to the very edges of all their fields. They'd leave a, you know, a foot or two on the edge uh, just standing there, right? And then they wouldn't also pick up everything that, you know, that fell sort of behind them. And poor people were allowed to go onto people's property and walk behind the harvesters and collect the things that they'd picked up and collect the standing grain that was left on the edges of their fields. And God provided this law to, to bless poor people. Ruth was poor, but she trusted God, and she put her trust into action by going out and getting the grain that God had sort of provided for her and people like her, right? Now, it just so happens, you read there, um, uh, wherever it is, in... Um, Verse 3, it just so happens <laughs> that the field Ruth went, uh, went to belonged to Boaz. And that's Jewish humour, in case you missed that. That's, that, that's meant to be funny. Because uh, whoever wrote Ruth is telling us that God knows exactly what's going on. And while it might look like Ruth just kind of stumbled into this field by accident, the author wants us to see God's hand in the background, God leading Ruth to this particular field because she has an appointment there with this guy called Boaz. It just so happens. And in verse 4, we meet Boaz, the dude of dudes, and it turns out that Boaz is an Anglican minister. Now, you, you might not be familiar with the Anglican prayer book, and if you're not, don't, like, don't feel bad. The thing was written in 1549, okay? So it's a, it's a while old now. It's been, it's been revised, it was revised in 1662 and a few other times. But the first words in the old prayer book that the minister is meant to say is, the Lord be with you, right? And... Uh, so he would say that, and the people are meant to, res meant to respond. Now, if you know it, you can yell it out, okay? What are people meant to say back? And also with you. Isn't that nice, right? See, we really are Anglicans, right? But, but Boaz's mates, they're all Baptists, right? And so they say, the Lord bless you, which is kind of close enough. You, you, get the, you, know, you get the drift of what they're doing. Anyway, Boaz is a single bloke. Uh, he's wealthy. He owns a decent farm, and he's got a heap of people working for him. And you can see by the way he greets his workers that he's a godly bloke with a really strong, active, living faith in God because he asks God to bless his workers. And the way they respond tells us that they know they're working for a good guy because they say, hey, God, please bless our boss. He's a great guy, right? Now, imagine how cool it would be to work for a bloke like that. Imagine, you know, you're at work and the boss walks in and says, the Lord be with you. Uh, Ray does that to us all the time. Like, he walks around the place, he, like, because he's a great boss. He's like, to be quite honest, he's the best bloke I've ever worked for, right? But he says that sort of stuff to us. He's, he's like, because he wants God to bless us, right? If you're a manager of some sort in, you know, wherever you work or you're in some sort of a leadership role, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to somehow let your team or your staff know that you're the kind of person who wants God's blessing to be on their lives. 
And you mightn't say it like Boaz does. Like if you go to work tomorrow morning and say, the Lord bless you or the Lord be with you or whatever, right? And people will look at you all weird. Don't come back to me next week and say, Steve, I did that thing you said and I, I, like, I, got, I went to see HR straight away. <laughs> Don't do that, right? <laughs> um, but you can say it in other ways and you can demonstrate it by the way you talk to people, the way, the way you treat people. And my guess is that that would be quite a powerful thing in a secular workplace, yeah? Anyway, verse 5. Boaz asks his foreman, who does that young woman belong to? Now, if this was a movie, uh, there'd be some strings playing in the background. We'd go into soft focus and the cameras would pan around to Ruth, you know, working in the field, collecting all the grain behind the harvesters. Uh, but the foreman, it's not a movie, so it continues. Uh, the, the, the foreman tells Boaz that she's the young woman who came back from Moab with Naomi and it turns out she's been working since the early morning in the field and it's now late in the afternoon. She's, she's sweaty, she's dirty, hair's a mess and if you asked her, she'd probably say, no, I'm, I'm not looking the best, right? But notice that Boaz isn't just looking at her outward appearance, right? He, he's noticed something more than her looks. He's heard of this young woman, everyone's heard of this young woman, because you don't turn up as a foreigner in Bethlehem with Naomi, whom no one has seen for a decade, and go unnoticed, right? So people know that Ruth loves Naomi and cares for her. They also know that she's come to trust in their God as well. But Boaz sees Ruth's character. Now our culture, you'll know this, but our culture is almost the opposite of that, isn't it? Because these days we've got Instagram and Facebook and all the other social media apps on our phones and on our computers and whatever. And all of those things focus on the outward appearance of everybody. And, so, and you can Photoshop yourself to make yourself look you know, better and everything is about what you're wearing or, or more usually what you're not wearing. But God and God's people should be paying much more attention to the heart, right? the character. And this is what Boaz is doing. And Ruth's character is worth noticing. Now, listen to the way Boaz talks to Ruth, right? And what I want you to hear as this conversation goes on is Boaz's character. So remember, in this culture, a woman like Ruth is about as vulnerable as a woman can be, right? She's a foreigner. She's a widow. There's no man to protect her. She's alone. She's in a new town. Moab and Israel were often at war with each other. And so even though people knew that she was looking after Naomi, there would have been a bunch of people who hated her just because she was from Moab. And although she trusted in God, this morning when she got up and went to this field, there would have been a little bit of fear and nervousness in her heart because back then, as now, any terrible thing could have happened to a woman in that sort of a position. But listen to the godly example Boaz gives men, us men, who love God and want to honour him in their lives. Listen to this, verse 8. Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Now imagine what that sounds like to Ruth. Right? She knows that she is now perfectly safe with this man. And she probably wouldn't have been safe anywhere else. And he's told, the, he's told his workers that if any of them touch her, that's the last thing they touch. If she's thirsty, his water is her water. The other women in the field, they're now your community and you'll be safe with them. This is quite an extraordinary thing. In verse 10, at this she bows down with her face to the ground and she asks him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and you came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. So he's not only provided a safe place for Ruth to work and gather food for her and Naomi, now he's praying for her that God would bless her for the kindness that she's shown to her mother-in-law. And for her part, Ruth knows that socially she would not normally be on the receiving end of this 
honourable behaviour from Boaz, right? So verse 13, she says, May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord. You've put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, even though I don't have the standing of one of your servants. <laughs> Boaz is kind of on a roll, right? This is a good guy on a roll. He's not finished. At mealtime, he says to her in verse 14, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, like this, Israel, Israelis and Moabites don't eat together. It's just, it just does not happen. And here he is, come and sit with me. He offers her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and she had some left over. As she got up to keep working, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves. Like let her pick some of the grain that you've already bundled together. Give her some of that. And even pull some stalks out and put them on the ground so she can pick them up and don't tell her off. It's extraordinary. So Boaz isn't just offering his protection to Ruth, he's going over the top in making sure that she's well fed and has plenty of grain to take home to Naomi so she can be well fed as well. Now at this point in the story, it's important to know there's no romance going on, right? This isn't love at first sight, this is respect and honour at first sight, right? Because that's Boaz's character, that's the kind of guy he is. Now we find out in chapter 3 that Boaz is quite a bit older than Ruth and when it looks like there might be something kind of romantic going on between them. He's genuinely shocked that Ruth has, you know, been looking at him instead of chasing after some of the younger blokes in town. So this is just a good, godly man acting in a good and godly way toward a younger woman he's treating as if she were his daughter. And gentlemen... This is how each of us is meant to treat all the women we know. All of them. Every single one of them. Respect, honour, care, protection and provision. That's what God expects of us. Right? I very rarely feel vulnerable physically. Uh, most men I know are the same. And you don't have to be, you know, 6'2 and almost 100 kilos to feel safe. You just basically need to be male. As far as I can figure, that's kind of how it works in this world. But if you talk to any of the women you know, of any age, it turns out that most women rarely feel safe and very often feel quite vulnerable. And I, to be honest, I can't actually imagine that. I don't know what that feels like. This world is not a safe place for the vast majority of females. One of my friends is a young woman who I met through uh, LIT and Kick, and she's kind of much more like a daughter than a friend, really. She is a strong Christian young lady, crazy gifted in so many ways. She's an amazing person and beautiful. And she was travelling overseas and she met a bloke who spiked her drink and then raped her on the beach. And there was no one around to help her. There was no, no Boaz to make things right. And uh, when she got back, she told me what had happened. We, uh, she, you know, and when she told me, I, I, I was crying my eyes out. It's dreadful. This, this world is not a safe place for most women which means that it's up to men, and in particular Christian men, to make it safe. So gentlemen, no matter where you are, uh, if you see a woman in any kind of danger, your job and my job is to get between the woman and whatever is causing the danger as quick as you possibly can. Right? This, is, this is what Boaz is doing for Ruth, and he's doing it because he knows that's what God expects believing men to do for women. Now Ruth knows that she's safe with Boaz. Nothing is going to happen to her while he's around. It's pretty cool. And so after having something to eat in verse 17, she goes back to work. And as the chapter finishes, we learn that Ruth goes home to Naomi with about 13 kilos of barley. Uh, that's a lot of barley, is it? Like that's a good couple of weeks worth of food, yeah? 
Uh, and Naomi's beside herself when Ruth comes home. And like any mother-in-law in this kind of situation, she's got a whole bunch of questions. Where did you glean? Uh, who's filled with you? you know, what's going on? Where'd you get that? Uh, right? That's kind of what mothers-in-law do, right? Uh, I mean that with the deepest of respect. Uh, now, Ruth tells Naomi, <laughs> Ruth tells Naomi that she's in Boaz's field. And Naomi's like, ha, ha, ha. Boaz, the dude of dudes, right? Now, as I said before, there's no love interest going on just yet, but you can't help feeling that when Naomi hears where Ruth was, that she's starting to think, oh, okay, now I'm just going to have to figure out how to give uh, Ruth a bit of a nudge so that she goes and gets in Boaz's way a bit more often, you know, and maybe he'll notice her and then who knows, right? And there's good reason for this. Look at verse 20. The Lord bless him, Naomi says to her daughter-in-law. He's not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. This man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. And then Ruth says, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Right, so you're going to be well fed for a long time. One of the interesting provisions that God made for his people was an, a law in the Old Testament called the Leverite law. Okay, now you may not have heard of this, you may have, whatever. Uh, here's, what, here's how it works. Say you've got a, a married couple and the husband dies before they have any kids. So the Leverite law is the dead husband's brother, or if he doesn't have a brother, a close relative, would marry the widow and then provide her with children. And this would do two things. It would keep the dead husband's name alive so that it wouldn't be lost. And it would provide the widow with children who would look after her when she got older. And so we hear this law and we go, that's kind of weird. You know, like if this happened now and, you know, heaven forbid, but, you know, you're married and your husband dies and then the brother comes along and says, I got you. You'd be like, bro, please. My life's bad enough. I do not need this now, right? <laughs> but back in the Old Testament, this is kind of God's way of making sure, hey, there's no government welfare, but I want to make sure that my people are going to be taken care of. So it's like the, the thing with the, the grain on the edge of the field. This is God providing for his people in difficult circumstances. Now, it just so happens that Boaz is closely related to Elimelech, which makes him what Naomi calls a guardian redeemer. That means it's possible for Boaz to marry Ruth and provide children for her and grandchildren for Naomi, thus meaning that Elimelech's, Elimelech's family line continues and Naomi and Ruth are both taken care of as they get older. Now, we're going to see how that plays out next week. Ray is looking at chapter 3 and 4 next week. Um, but as we finish up chapter 2, the glaringly obvious message of this chapter is that even while life has taken several tragic turns for Naomi and Ruth, God is orchestrating one of the great comebacks in history for this family. Uh, he got them safely to Bethlehem from Moab. He led Ruth to gather grain in a field that just so happened to belong to Boaz, who just so happens to be a man of distinctly godly character. And because Boaz is God's man in this situation, he provides for Ruth in so many ways. He gives her heaps of food. He gives her a community of women to, to do life with. Uh, he gives her absolute protection from anyone who would seek to do her harm. And he prays for God's blessing to be over her life. And on top of all that, it just so happens that Boaz is one of the few men capable of enacting this Leverite law that God had put in place to provide for widows among his people. And he can marry Ruth and provide a family for her. It just so happens. I think this is what I find so encouraging about Ruth. Lots of stories in the Bible are of people doing things, God's people doing things wrong you know, all the time, right? And Ruth's kind of the opposite. I, I, this is what good looks like. Um, one of my good mates is a leadership coach, right? So he goes around to different churches and he coaches and trains ministers and church workers and whatever in leadership and development and all that sort of thing, right? And when he meets his clients, he has a series of questions that he asks them. Uh, I think the best one that he asks them is this. He says, what does good look like? Now, he didn't make this question up. Someone else did, right? But it's a good one, isn't it? What does good look like? And all of us can ask this question of ourselves. What does good look like in my work life, uh, in my family life, in my Christian life, in my relationships? Right? And when you ask yourself this question, what does good look like? 
uh, you can answer it and you figure out what you need to do to go from where you are to where you want to be as, a, as an employee or as an employer, as a husband or a wife or a friend or, a, or just a Christian, whatever. What does good look like? Ruth, tells, Ruth 2 tells us what good looks like on so many levels. So what, we look at Ruth. What does good look like for Ruth? She's got a strong faith in God and she puts that faith into action by working hard and providing for Naomi. Right? So for Ruth, good looks like trusting God in hard circumstances. All of us have been in hard circumstances. What does good look like for you when life goes pear-shaped? It looks like trusting God in hard circumstances. Now Ruth, she's taking responsibility for herself. She's not expecting anyone to pick up the bill. She does receive kindness from Boaz and she accepts it joyfully and she thanks Boaz for his kindness and she also thanks God for his provision for her. Right? This is perfect. This is, this is good. And Boaz, what's good look like for Boaz? Well, good for Boaz looks like thinking, speaking and acting in a way that honours God in everything he does. So you look at him through the chapter. He blesses his employees. He notices Ruth and he goes and speaks really kindly to her. He praises her character, her hard work in gathering grain for Naomi. He provides her with his protection. He makes her not just feel safe but actually be safe. They're two different things. He provides way more food for her than she needs. She put, he puts her in a community of women her age and so she's got an instant group of friends. Boaz provides everything Ruth will need to flourish in her new life in Israel. And gentlemen, uh, Boaz is close to, if not the best, example that God has given each of us as to what it looks like to be a Christian bloke in God's world. Because all through the book, he doesn't actually do anything wrong. He doesn't do anything dodgy at all. Apart from Jesus, I'm just trying to think if there's someone else who manages to pull that off. There'd be a handful. There's not many. This guy is a great example. Ruth is a great love story, but it's more than just a love story, isn't it? Uh, I said in the beginning that it's, it's like a mini version of the enormous love story of the whole Bible. So Boaz kind of gives us a, a, a look at or a reflection of God's character in the way that God has provided everything we need in the Lord Jesus. Right? Everything that you and I need to flourish in this life, God has given to us in Jesus. Right? And even more than that, Everything that you and I need to flourish in the life to come, God has also provided for us in the Lord Jesus. And Boaz is a reflection of that. How about we pray? Uh, Father God, we do uh, thank you for this little book, Ruth. And we thank you for uh, this bloke, Boaz, uh, who kind of reminds us of your character and uh, the way you provide for us in Jesus. Uh, Lord, as we go through this uh, next week as well, please help us see uh, that, um, that reflection of your character and the Lord Jesus even more clearly uh, as we see how this story unfolds. And Father, help us. I want to pray particularly for the men here. Uh, Lord, please uh, help us to be, I guess, shaped by... Uh, the character of this godly bloke in the way we treat women around us. Please help us to honour, uh, to care for, uh, to protect and to provide uh, whatever we can uh, to make the women in our lives feel uh, safe and be safe. And we ask this, Lord, so that they may know your blessing in their lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.